Back in the mid-1970s, I attended the Way College of Emporia in Emporia, Kansas, where I studied biblical studies. Earned a degree in theology, but I don't normally think of it in terms of theology. I just think of biblical research as really what it was. Um, and the Way College of Emporia was the most picturesque little campus that you would ever imagine. Small campus, small college, but just so beautiful. And the centerpiece of that campus was Anderson Library, which was one of the historic and beautiful Carnegie Libraries. Most of you probably aren't familiar with Carnegie Libraries. Most people probably today don't even know who Andrew Carnegie was, although he was one of the richest men in the history of America. And you probably have heard his name on a lot of other buildings, such as Carnegie Hall and Carnegie Mellon University um, and a number of other important places, buildings. Because Carnegie was one of the great, not only was he one of the richest men in America in the turn of the 19th century, but he was also one of the great philanthropists, one of the greatest philanthropists of all times. And that library, the Carnegie Library at Emporia, was one of over 2,500 public libraries that he had given money for the building of it around the world. That I knew at the time that I went there. I knew it was a Carnegie Library. I knew that was historic and why. I didn't know the full story of the significance of it, um, and I'd like to read a little bit about that um, to kind of give you not only more of an idea of, of what Carnegie did, but just also for those that are familiar with the Way College of Emporia, I think it'll bless them. The library was built, has the centerpiece of the campus of the College of Emporia, a private institution originally affiliated with the Presbyterian Church. The college was founded in 1884 and was located on spacious grounds in the northwestern corner of Emporia. Has an acquaintance of the college's first president, Reverend John F. Hendy, and a Presbyterian, Presbyterian himself, Carnegie was anxious to build the monument to his boyhood hero at the College of Emporia. In his autobiography, Carnegie credited the furthering of his education to Anderson, Anderson Library, a wealthy iron maker who opened his extensive personal library on Saturdays to young working men of the neighborhood. Between 1886 and 1929, the Carnegie Foundation worked to repay Anderson's kindness by helping to fund over 2,500 libraries around the world. So you see the significance of Anderson Library? It's, it's yeah. this man who, when Carnegie had nothing, and Carnegie, you know, he became one of the wealthiest, but he was a Scottish immigrant who started off absolutely nothing, working at a very young age, and built this vast, vast empire steel, Carnegie Steel, um, which you know, along, it was Carnegie for steel, Vanderbilt for the railroads, Rockefeller for oil, Ford for cars. Those guys are, has, there's an interesting series on them, the men who built America. Andrew Carnegie may be the most influential philanthropist in American history. The scale of his giving is almost without peer. Adjusted for inflation, his donations exceed those of virtually everyone else in the nation's history. Wow. Mm. Although he died nearly a century ago, Carnegie is still the biggest philanthropist of all time. Wow. He amassed one of the largest fortunes ever seen through the burgeoning U.S. steel industry. $298.3 billion adjusted for inflation in 2007 when this was written. $298 billion. Wow. 
After that, the Scottish immigrant spent the last 20 years of his life giving away over 90% of his wealth. He didn't keep 90 and give away 10, he gave away 90% of his wealth. Carnegie do donated liber liberally to education, establishing universities, schools, and nearly 3,000 free public libraries across the English-speaking world. You know, <clears throat> Carnegie wasn't the only philanthropist of the time. Rockefeller was a great philanthropist, as was, um, oh, Ford and, and a couple of the other ones. It's interesting, uh, you know, when you look at this stuff. Vanderbilt was, the only thing Vanderbilt ever really donated to was the college that's named in, for him. Um, and out of all the ones that have heirs, his family is, is the one with the least wealth to this day. Mm -hmm. So he passed it on to fools. <laughs> he saved it and gave it to fools um, that just squandered it, whereas Carnegie gave it all away. You know, at that time, and they sort of established this um, tradition of philanthropy that has had a resurgence at the end of the 20th century with men like Elon Musk and Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and a number of others that are considered the new philanthropists that also have amassed great fortunes and given much of it away. And those guys like Carnegie, they sort of instilled in the psyche of America the idea that those that had great wealth had a responsibility to share it, to do something with it. That those that had the ability had a responsibility to use it for the benefit of others. And I thought of all of this in light of what we're going to be looking at in this section of Philippians, and you can turn to Philippians chapter 2. Because this evening we're going to see that we have been given great riches in Christ. That we have been entrusted with so much and that we also have a responsibility to use it for the benefit of others. In Philippians chapter 2, this section kind of began, the, the theme of the this, of this section in Philippians 2 began in verse 5 where it said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind, these thoughts that Jesus Christ had, be our thoughts, the way that we think, the way that we behave. And we'll skip down. We left off in verse 8 last time. We'll read that again. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus Christ humbled himself and was obedient to God with no holds barred. Obedient all the way to giving his life on the cross. Nothing was held back in his obedience. There was nothing that the Father asked that was too much for him. He was literally willing to lay down his life. That's the example. That's the thoughts, those kind of thoughts that we're to have. Not that we're to lay down our lives physically, but that standard is used for the standard of obedience and service to God. Verse 9 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name, should be the name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ always did the Father's will, and he gave his life on the cross so that we could in turn have life. And because of that, because of what he accomplished for us, his name has been magnified above every name. A name, and especially in the East, signifies everything that that person has. All of their power, all of their wealth, all of their 
influence, everything behind that name. And Jesus Christ's name is above every name, so that every knee bows to that name. Every knee. You know, a knee being bowed. If, you, if in olden days, and maybe a little less formally done, but kind of still halfway done, that if you went and were presented before a king or a queen, you would bow the knee to that king or queen showing that you recognized their authority, their power, and that you were subject to them. Everyone, everything is subject to Jesus Christ. That's what he gained through his humbling himself. You know, it's a, it's a theme that you see often in the Gospels, that he that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. That if we try to go about in life exalting ourselves in whatever way, you know, not just like, hey, look at me, I'm important, but people do it in so many ways. Some of the men and women that have amassed great fortunes, they've done it to exalt themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, to some extent, not to, not to take a little bit off of the shine of what Carnegie or others did, but they got their names on those buildings, don't they? Yeah. They want people to know that they're the ones that pay for the thing. They want their names to be remembered. They have exalted themselves, at least in that way. And people exalt themselves in so many ways. And yet, it says that if we humble ourselves, then we're exalted. Verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, has ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Looking at the example of Jesus Christ's obedience, then verse 12 says, Wherefore, and wherefore always indicates that what is about to follow is a result of what's already been said. Wherefore, looking at that, as a result of that, we should work out our own wholeness. We should, was, as we always obeyed, work out our own wholeness is the word. The word salvation in the Greek is soteria. It means wholeness. It's, it, just to give you an idea of, of how that word is also used in other places, it's translated health. In Acts 27:34, we looked at that record of Acts 27 not long ago. You remember when Paul, after 14 days that nobody had eaten because they were in that right. storm, and he tells them to, to they should eat, and it says for your health. Okay, that word health is wholeness. It's that same word that's used here of work out your own salvation, your own wholeness, your own health, your completeness. <laughs> And it says with fear and trembling. And that doesn't mean that we should be afraid of God. That's an idiom. It's, it is an Eastern expression. Um, Bishop Ply in his book, Orientalism, Volume 1, has a chapter entitled Fear and Trembling where he handles that phrase and, and this, this verse of Scripture and shows that it is an idiom. And, and it just means respect and obedience. That that's what that fear and trembling is. It is just recognizing again how great God is and subjecting ourselves to Him. We're to be obedient just like Jesus Christ was obedient. It goes on to say then, in verse 13, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Who works in us? God. God. It's God who works in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. But that only can happen when we are obedient to Him. When we're obedient to God's Word, and when we're obedient to that Spirit of God, that's when He can work in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. If I don't know the will of God, God can't work in me to will and to do of His good pleasure. If I'm not willing to be obedient to him, if I'm not willing to subject myself to him, he can't do it. God will never overstep our free will. 
God will never work in you. You know, well, I wish God would quit working in me and doing that stuff. You know, he, he just worked in me to do this wonderful thing. And I, I just wanted to be mean to these people. And I don't know why he did that. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. As we are obedient to him, as we're walking with him, then God can work within us. And he works in us to accomplish the things that he would like to accomplish. What kind of things do you think that is? Well, what kind of things did he have Jesus Christ do? What was it that he worked in Jesus Christ to do? Heal the sick, you know, preach cap deliverance to the captives, all of those things that Jesus Christ did, that's the way that God would also work in us if we allow him to. And again, allowing is simply walking with him. I emphasize the point because some Christians think allowing him is, well, I just turn over my free will to God. I just relinquish my... No! That's not it. That's not the way that God works. God doesn't ask us to give up our freedom of will. It says the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Other important verses like that. He works in us as we, say, as we walk with him. Father, what should I do in this situation? Here's a need. Here's a person. You know, over the last few weeks, uh, uh, I've had a number of times where I've gone to the hospital to visit people that were seriously ill. And whenever I walk into a situation like that, uh, number one, I'll tell you, I, I always walk in there feeling like I have no idea what I should do in this situation. <laughs> I, I really don't. You know, some people are really at ease in situations like that. I, that's, I'm not. I'm not in, at ease in a situation like that or in a situation when somebody's just suffered the loss of someone. And yet, I've always looking back at it, sort of been amazed at how helpful I was in that situation and how graciously I handled it. But not because it was that I have that within my own abilities, but it is a situation that I walk in and I think to myself as I'm going, what would Jesus Christ do in the situation? I'm here to represent him. What would he have me say? What would he have me do? And then I just look and trust for him to do that as I go in there and talk to people and look to minister to them and however I can. You see, that's what God will do. But again, it's us inviting it. Well, we'll go on. Verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now, this is a verse that I spent some real time on. Um, doing all things without murmurings and disputings because I was taught something a long time ago that's always stuck in my brain, but it's not exactly the way that any translation that I've seen handles it, and I do mean any. <laughs> The way that this is most often translated, do all things without murmurings and disputings, is do all things without grumbling or disputing. I'll read you the ESV. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. And some translations would have arguing for that word disputing. And that would seem to be basically saying, don't complain, don't argue, um, don't fight amongst yourselves. But what I had been taught years ago and always stuck in my mind was that it was in direct reference to God working in us to willing to do of his good pleasure and to basically not argue with that walking by the Spirit, what the Holy Spirit was working in you to do. So I dug into it, and the word will handle murmurings first, and that one's the more simple one. It's only, it comes from a word 
Gangusmus. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Um, it's translated three times murmuring and one time grudging. And it means to murmur, a muttering, a secret debate, a secret displeasure not openly avowed. It's only used four times, so it's not too many times. And, and it really is pretty simple, and that is to not murmur. A good place where it's used to get the idea of it is Acts 6.1, where it says, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because the widows were neglected of the daily ministration. So that murmuring amongst them, you know, it was like that, they weren't going to openly bring this to the leadership. It wasn't openly avowed. This wasn't like, okay, we're getting a committee together and we think this is wrong. No, it's just amongst themselves that, why? Well, I think it's shameful the way that they're neglecting the widows. Why well, do too? And they would just complain amongst themselves and saw almost like a little gossipy kind of a thing was what they were doing. And that's what the essence of that word is every place it's used. So this word murmuring does fit within that context here of, again, Philippians, the, the greater theme, one of the great elements of it, is unity, like-mindedness, right? And so that murmuring says, do all things without there being a different mind, without there being like these secret disputes. The word, though, Disputings is a much different word. And no place that it's used is it anything external at all. The word disputings comes from a word dialog dialogismos. One of these days I'm really going to work on my pronunciation on this stuff. But you get the idea. Dia, you see the word logos in there, right? And the King James trans translates that thought nine times. Reasoning one time, imagination one time, doubtful one time, disputing one time, and doubting one time. It means thoughts, inward reasoning, a, deliber a deliberating, questioning about what is true or doubting. I'll read you real quickly excerpts from a number of these. I'm not going to read every place that it's used, but to see how it's used. In Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, so forth. Luke 5, 22, but when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said unto them, why reason you in your hearts? Luke 6, 8, but he knew their thoughts and said to the man with the withered hand, Luke 6, 9, 46, Luke 9, 46 to 47, and there arose a reasoning, and in verse 47, and Jesus perceiving the thought of their hearts, reasoning and thought, those are that same word. Romans 1, 21, um, they weren't thankful, but, be, but became vain in their imaginations. You might have wondered where that imagination one was. In 1 Corinthians 3.20, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise. 1 Timothy 2.8, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. James 2.4, are you become judges of evil thoughts? Do you see all the places? Everywhere it's talking about thoughts. Everywhere it's talking about thoughts. And often, thoughts that they had inwardly, but that were known to Jesus Christ or somebody else, even though they were inward thoughts that they, God was giving revelation of basically where that person was at. So this murmurings and disputings fits both with the idea of the unity, like-mindedness, but also that has, it's God that's working in us to willing to do of his good pleasure, we should do all things without questioning that. That we should not argue against the revelation. One of the great keys to walking with the Spirit is don't argue with God. That when you've gotten revelation, when God's telling you something, well then, don't doubt it. Don't hesitate. Don't question it in your mind. Don't have doubtful thoughts. But instead, follow what God's directed. And if you're going to be able to follow, again, if you're going to be able to follow what God's directing you, 
by his spirit within you, you have to first follow what he's given you direction by what he's written in his word. All right, moving on. Verse 15. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Boy, we are in a crooked and perverse nation. Um, you know, I wonder if every time throughout history that that's been read, people have thought, boy, it sure is. But it sure is. It always has been. It always has been, and, and it does seem that the longer you live, the more crooked and perverse your particular nation seems to get. And it's why it's so important that we do shine as lights that we shine his lights, that we are blameless and harmless. Blameless. Not without fault, but blameless. And harmless. That all we, all we want to do is help people. And this dark, dark world so needs your help. It so needs for us to shine as those lights. Jesus Christ gave his life in service. And that's what this section is pointing us to do as well. To walk with God like he walked with God. Doing it like he did, having those same kind of thoughts. So that we also can serve. That we can serve as those lights in this dark and perverse nation. Verse 16 says, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Holding forth that word of life, because it is that word of life that gives people life. It sets them free. We are the lights in this world, but we only shine as we carry that light with us, as we let that light of God's word shine forth from us, as we let that Christ in us shine out. That's how we're the lights of this world. That's how we can help this world. That's how we can change this world. And don't ever underestimate the importance of your life. Don't ever undervalue how important you are. That God's called you. Think of how this fits with sections like 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, where it talks about us being ambassadors for Christ. And again, having that word of reconciliation, not only that ministry of reconciliation, but the word of reconciliation. We have this word of life that we carry, that we give to people. And as we do that, boy, we can just shine so brilliantly. Light dispels darkness. Light dispels darkness. We know that so simply in the physical world, has all we have to do is turn off the lights and you light one candle and it's no longer dark, right? Mm -hmm. See yourself as that light. And keep shining brighter and brighter. You know, when you first start to learn a little bit about God, you first start walking with Him, maybe you're like a birthday candle. <laughs> you know, you're just like that little birthday candle. And then somehow that grows into a taper and then one of those big ones and you can't see it on the video but behind we have these candles they're not even lit are they lit mm -hmm. okay they're lit they're fake though <laughs> 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 and then that keeps getting bigger and bigger till it's it's a you know a bonfire and it's the huge bonfire as we walk in more and more with God our lights shine brighter and brighter You know, uh, we'll, we'll read the next couple of verses and we'll close after that. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice for you all. For the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. He said he was offered on the sacrifice and service of their faith, their believing. That he, joy, he had joy and rejoicing. 
It seems paradoxical, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That service and sacrifice are what bring joy and rejoicing. You know, Jesus Christ being obedient unto death, that, that doesn't sound like a reason to rejoice, does it? Mm -hmm. But you know what it says about that? It says that looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, not despising the shame, and, and so forth. He, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. That's how he did it. And we have that joy and rejoicing to look forward to as well. Jesus Christ lived that way. The Apostle Paul lived that way. And we, in turn, are called to live that way as well. We have been given so much. We've been entrusted with so much. And to whom much is given, much is expected. And we have much to give in turn. God bless you.